Hello everybody and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion of queer kinship and today I want us to talk about queer reproduction. In order to talk about queer reproduction, let's first look at some of the intergenerational connections between this piece and the piece by Kath Weston that we read from Monday. So on Monday, we were looking at San Francisco in the 1980s. That was a long time ago now. And we were looking at kin relationships forged between queer community members without either marriage or reproduction. And marriage, of course, was completely completely illegal for same-sex couples at that time, and it wasn't recognized nationwide in the U.S. until about six years ago, so that's still pretty recent. As for reproduction, it's important to remember that being queer doesn't make you infertile. It may be that your preferred sexual activities are not going to result in biological reproduction, but many queer people, um, especially queer people who were trying to live a normal life and be accepted by their families, would have got married and then might have had children from previous relationships after they came out of the closet. However, in the 80s, we wouldn't have really seen same-sex couples adopting children in ways that are common now or using assisted fertility methods. That wasn't so much a thing. But when we separate kin relationships from marriage and reproduction, it's really revolutionary and it means we really need to rethink this whole kinship thing because all of a sudden these two foundational aspects of kinship just don't matter anymore. We have kin relationships without these things. But now we are going to fast forward 30 to 40 years because queer people keep coming to San Francisco. And this means that there is multi-generational queer community with queer elders who are capable of socially reproducing queer community norms by passing them on to younger community members. And this is really cool because it means that there's some kind of social reproduction happening, even if it's not biological reproduction. So. Let's talk about where in San Francisco we are in the 2010s. Shange worked at Robeson, which she describes as a small in-district public high school serving about 250 students with an explicit social justice vision of liberation, which is kind of awkward because most state policies in the U.S. are not really about liberation, but more about imprisoning as many people as possible. Robeson also stands out because San Francisco is one of the most gentrified places in the U.S. because of the success of tech industries located nearby. Property in San Francisco is absolutely unbelievably expensive. And goods and services in San Francisco are correspondingly gourmet and fancy and expensive. And so it's just increasingly hard for average people who are not Silicon Valley millionaires or billionaires to live there. So within this context of very rich people who, because this is the U.S., are almost all going to be white... We have this one high school, Robeson, which Change tells us was the blackest high school in the least black city in America and functioned as one of the few remaining black serving institutions in the city. So if you're a black kid in San Francisco, Robeson is where it's at. During the period that she was doing her research, she was working as a volunteer teacher, and she was one of several out gay teachers at Robeson. And this is also part of the explicit San Francisco-ness of the story. 
San Francisco is a place where it's okay to be gay, where your teachers can be gay because there are rainbow flags on every corner. And in fact, if you didn't have out gay people, that would be weird. And one thing that's really interesting about the context of this particular school in terms of one of the things that Shange wants to tell us is that a lot of research has examined schools as being hostile to queer teachers and hostile to queer students, but research hasn't really looked at how queer students and queer teachers can together form queer communities, especially queer communities of color. So this article starts with a fight. And Shane tells us that this is only really to be expected because queer black kinship means fighting. To be queer is to pick a fight with larger society that maybe doesn't want to give you space to, as Shane says, live and love autonomously. But to be especially black and queer means to be more stigmatized than either other black people or other queer people. And so there is a lot of inherited trauma from being black, and there's a lot of constant vulnerability to oppression that is just a result of being visibly black and or visibly queer. And so as a result, racialized queer folks, she tells us, end up fighting against one another instead of alongside each other. Which means that we need to talk about intersectionality. It's impossible to talk about one access of oppression like gender, race, or class without simultaneously talking about all of them. For example, class is one way that you can be oppressed. If you historically come from a family that doesn't have a lot of money, you are going to experience oppression growing up. You're going to have a hard time um, finding ways to get class mobility. But race and class overlap a lot because who is more likely to be poor? It's the racialized minorities that are oppressed along that axis, right? So we have to talk about all the ways that people can be oppressed together rather than separately. And when we talk about intersectionality, we also have to appreciate the fact that an individual person's social position is going to be located at a complicated nexus or intersection of all different kinds of privileges and oppression all of which affect each other in ways that aren't simply additive. You can't do like privilege and oppression math. So it's not like I gain privilege points for being a white American English speaker, but then I lose some for being a woman. It's, it's not like that. It's, it's the, where I sit with all of the identities that I carry within me is a unique intersection with advantages and disadvantages and things that are easy for me to see and things that are difficult for me to see. And thank you, Kimberly Crenshaw, a black scholar, for giving us this concept. So queer rights have come very far in the US since the 1980s, but if you've looked at the news from the US in the last year, you will know that anti-black racism is still an enormous problem. And it's not like it's 100% okay to be gay. And especially if you are gender variant, like Cairo, one of the heroes, I guess, of this article, um, it's especially difficult right now because trans rights have really become a new battleground in American popular culture. So black queer kids and adults are fighting on multiple fronts with respect to their queer identities, their gender identities, and their racialized position in society. So given all this, what does life for queer black kids actually look like? There are gender norms of larger black culture. Um, black men, black people, but specifically black men are disproportionately p 
policed and therefore disproportionately likely to wind up in prison. About 30% of American black men will go to prison. And that's just, yeah, that's completely out of proportion. And this is a part of a process that actually starts with disproportionate discipline in schools where black children are often punished more harshly than white children. And this is called the school to prison pipeline in American sociological literature. As a result, black women and queer femmes wind up playing really strong supportive roles and keeping everything together because the men are in jail. Not necessarily because they're committing more crimes than anyone else, but because the police are looking for them to be committing crimes, if that makes sense. There are also some gender divisions in specifically black lesbian communities with studs or more masculine women often receiving masculine privilege while femme women wind up again playing this role that black women often play of keeping things together. And so queer teens get socialized into this aspect of black queer life in part by the actions of their own teachers. So we have this fight between these two teens, Cairo and Linnea, and what happens is that the masculine teenager, Cairo, the stud, winds up getting protected by the teachers because Cairo already has a police record, and if she gets in trouble, things are gonna be so much worse for her. But this means that Linnea is just sort of neglected in ways that she shouldn't be. These interactions between teachers and students at the school happen within kinship roles that are often assigned by the students to the teachers so that change is understood as a play auntie, another teacher is the school mom, and the dean of students is everybody grandma. And these roles aren't just cute titles. As with Weston, what makes people kin is fulfilling the obligations of kin to each other. So being a play auntie for change involves driving her students to the public health clinic to get STI tests, for example. The female auntie in particular is a recognizable black queer kinship role with maternal overtones. And as a result of that maternal authority carried by the black queer auntie, the femme auntie, the femme auntie is responsible in some ways for reproducing the stud femme dynamics of black lesbian life. And this is not just something that we see happening in secondary schools, but also something that we see happening in universities where this is a role that black lesbian women put themselves into, where as the auntie, they are familiar, but authoritative. So with all of the wonderful ethnographic information from Shange that's in this article, what do we have to add to our understanding of queer kinship? First of all, we have to note that queer kinship is reproductive within multi-generational queer communities because queer elders teach their juniors about the society they're entering and reproduce the society they're entering by saying, hey, there are specific roles within the society. You need to be either a stud or a femme. If you're going to be a stud, you behave like this. If you're a femme, you behave like this. Now, reproduction is not necessarily to be taken literally as biological, but it is certainly as valid as any kind of social reproduction that happens anywhere else. Biological reproduction is really only meaningful as part of human culture if it's accompanied by social reproduction, where new people are taught the ways of the society. Kinship is still based on doing the things that kin do for each other, but also sometimes failing each other dramatically in the way that families also fail, and 
This is more likely to be the case when queer folks are dealing with discrimination, stigmatization, and socioeconomic hardship at the intersection of racial, sexual, and gender categories. Thank you all for sticking with me, and I will talk to you next time.